All right. So next up is Matt Stoughton. Now, he's got an interest in the assassination in 2008. He runs one of the largest Facebook groups out there. Uh, but Matt, he runs one of the largest Facebook groups there is. Uh, I think the largest, actually. Uh, he's going to do a presentation on one of the more fascinating aspects that a lot of people ignore. The Tippett murder. What does it have to do with the assassination? Well, and what, what actually happened? How about that? Gee, are we asking ourselves that question about all different things here? What actually went on during World War II? What actually went on with Marita Lorenz? What actually went on? Yeah, because that's funny. A lot of times we're not told the truth directly. Funny thing about that. Anyway, Matt Dalton, come on, man. I definitely want to hear about this. Tempting is always great stuff. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, steps over here, sorry. This thing on? All right, awesome. It is. Thank you. Welcome to Dallas, everyone. Uh, how many people are not from Dallas or are visiting Dallas right now? Raise your hand. Okay, okay welcome. Welcome. We, this is my hometown of Dallas. I wish you a warm welcome. Uh, just as a little straw, straw pull right here, uh, how many people think that Oswald shot Officer Tippett? Okay. And how many people think Oswald didn't? Oh, we got two people. Two? Okay. And how many people think Oswald did not shoot Tippett? Okay. Okay. And how many people just aren't sure? Aren't sure on the fence? Okay. Okay. First and foremost, I really, really wish that I was not giving this presentation. It really should be the late, great Larry Ray Harris, who uh, he, died, he was the world's leading authority on the Tippett murder, and he, he died the year I was born, actually, so I uh, just wanted to give a little tribute to him. This is a quote from uh, Rob Clark, and I think it's one of the, the truest statements I've ever heard about the Tippett case, and he says, there's no happy ending to this story. There's no nice, neat bow you can put on this story. There's no definitive answers you're going to get from this story. And in fact, from this story, the only thing that ever comes out of it is more questions, unfortunately. Okay, so for many years, I... Uh, I just naturally assumed, of course, that uh, Oswald did not shoot President Kennedy, but you know, maybe he shot Tippett in self-defense uh, or something like that. But it wasn't until I read Mark Lane's book, Rush to Judgment, that um, I was stunned, stunned that I did not even know the basic facts of the Tippett story. And then when I saw Larry Harris's 1994 presentation at the Ask Conference on Tippett. That just, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to study next. So there have only ever been three books on, written on the case. Uh, Gary Murr wrote a wonderful, wonderful monograph in 1971. He sold it. Uh, Spiral Bound. This is right here. It's called The Murder of Officer Tippett. Uh, of course, we have uh, the, in 1998, Dale Myers, he published this book, With Malice, which, as Joseph McBride calls it, is the Warren Report of the Tippett Murder. <laughs> and it, it, it has good information, but you have to check everything. Check everything. So that's good information, but in, uh, I think I've made a list of like you know 30 major key points that he left out of his book, so that's, uh, you know... And of course, we have Joseph McBride's book, Into the Nightmare, um, which it, I feel is a mixed bag, but it has a ton of nuggets in it. A lot of good nuggets. Very good. Here are the books. This is from my personal collection. Okay. I'm not sure if you can see this, but uh, this is a 1960, either late 1963 or 1964 newspaper drawing of the murder. This is... Uh, First of all, we don't really know what happened on 10th Street about 45 minutes after the assassination, but this pretty much shows what happened. Uh, Officer Tippett 
uh, stopped to talk with a man that was walking through the neighborhood of Oak Cliff, and uh, he gets out apparently to talk with a man further or to arrest him, and Tippa gets blasted away, like really gunned down very violently. If anyone has ever seen the movie JFK, that, that's Tippett's scene where he gets gunned down. It's just brutal. So this is an early drawing of what happened. Does that look like Oswald? I don't know. Does that? No? no. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. This one does. Uh, this was from Chief Curry's book. This is a little more dramatic image of what happened. Now, what I want to do now is I want to fly through some made some fast facts on the Tippett murder. Basically, all everything you need to know about about the case. And this is I, I just want to fly through some points. And of course, as everyone everyone knows the basic story, the official story about how Oswald was went back to his room, got his gun, he just starts walking aimlessly around this. I'm sorry, but bizarre route, destination unknown, and then Tippett pulls up, uh, he sees the back of his head and says, that's the guy, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and then the official story says Oswald, he's, he's gonna apprehend Oswald, and Oswald you know, sh shoots him down dead, and everyone knows the rest of the story. But what I wanna lay out here, just, just some fast facts, everything you need to know about the Tippett case, and that is, Oswald could not have walked the nine-tenths of a mile from his rooming house in time to shoot Tippett. Oswald left his house at 1.03 p.m. and then waited, quote, several minutes at a bus stop. And Officer Tippett, by the available evidence, was apparently shot no later than 1.10. No one saw Oswald walking or jogging the supposed route. Also, Oswald would have been walking east, and yet all the witnesses say the killer was walking west. The Warren report claimed that Tippett was killed at 1.16 p.m., but we have 12 eyewitnesses who said it was much earlier than that. The closest witness to the shooting was never taken to a lineup. The star witness said she didn't recognize anyone in the lineup. She said she picked Oswald only because she got cold chills when she saw him. <laughs> and moreover, uh, there's no document from that day uh, where she says she identified anybody. The shells could not be matched with the bullets. The bullets could not be linked with the revolver. At the scene of the crime, an officer marked the shells with his initials to record the chain of evidence. Those initials are not on the shells which the Warren Commission presents to him. Three additional officers' initials also disappeared. The shells of evidence could not be identified by the witnesses as the ones they found that day. Four witnesses, four, picked Oswald, but from rigged lineups. Four witnesses picked Oswald's photo, but after he was dead and after he was nationally known. One witness only picked Oswald's photo after he was shot in the head. The closest witness only picked Oswald after his brother, who closely resembled him, was murdered. Twelve witnesses, twelve refused to identify Oswald as the killer or as the man fleeing the scene. Five witnesses, five witnesses said the killer was not Oswald. Six witnesses saw two men who were involved or may have been involved. One witness saw a man leave the shooting in a car. Two witnesses reported another police car at the scene when Tippett was shot, and another said that cops were already present when she came out of the house after hearing the shots. One witness, a guy named Cersei, was never interviewed. One potential witness, a guy named Holmes, was also never interviewed. One witness, a guy named Chapman, only heard the shots and didn't see the murder or the fleeing gunman. Three alleged witnesses came out of nowhere many years after the fact, and another one was mentioned. 
13 witnesses, 13, were ignored by the government altogether. The lead detective admitted that, that they didn't have any evidence on Oswald. The police found a white jacket. The jacket in evidence is gray. Oswald left his house wearing a dark jacket, but the killer wore a light jacket. The jacket in evidence is size medium. Oswald wore size small. The jacket in evidence bore a laundry tag, but Marina Oswald said none of her husband's clothes ever went to any laundry. Instead, she washed them herself. And in the end, the FBI scoured 717 laundries from Dallas to New Orleans and were unable to match the tag. Five of the six witnesses that were shown the gray jacket in evidence could not ID it. Five of the six witnesses that were shown Oswald's shirt could not ID it. The killer wore a light shirt and light jacket, yet Oswald was wearing a dark shirt and a dark jacket. And finally, the killer put his hands on Tippett's car, fingerprints were lifted, and they did not match Oswald. So those, that's pretty much all you ever need to know, everything you really need to know about the Tippett case. But I got an hour of time, so let's go a little bit deeper. I'm not sure if you read this or not, but this is District Attorney Henry Way. He said in 1992, we never worked any on his Tippett's murder. Well, that's cool. I mean, I mean, um, he, he's saying it. He's saying it. We never worked any on his Tippett's murder. At least he's being honest. I want to give a shout out to this boss lady right here. She, um, Alfreda Scobie, she was the only female Warren Commission staff member and she ultimately did not agree with the Warren Commission's conclusions. And uh, really, we would not, uh, Tippett w would not have been mentioned in, would not have had a chapter in the Warren Report had it not been for her. About several months into the investigation, into the investigation she wrote a memo saying, aren't we supposed to investigate this, this other murder? What well, gives, you know? <laughs> Sometimes it takes a woman to say, hey, hey, listen up, we gotta, you know, do this. So I just wanna give a shout out to the strong woman right here. We need more women in the case. We do, we really, really do. This was the lead detective on the Tippett case. He, this is him telling the witnesses, the eyewitnesses in the lineup, we want to be sure we want to try to wrap him up real tight on killing this officer. This officer, we think he is the same one that shot the president. But if we can wrap him up tight on killing this officer, we have got him. And this is the assistant, the assistant district attorney, William Alexander. He, he said in 1983, quote, we all knew the same man who killed the president had, had killed Tippett. We had made up our minds by the time we got there to the crime scene. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> so before they know what happened, before they've interviewed one single witness, they've already made up their minds about what happened. And that gets us to another thing, starting with a predetermined bias. And you hear in all of these main, mainstream books, they just nonchalantly say, you know, Oswald, you know, they talk about the Kennedy assassination, Kennedy this, Dealey Plaza, and they go over here to Oak Cliff, and then they say, oh, and then Oswald's walking down the street, and no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, you can't start off start off with a predetermined conclusion. So here's some of these books, these Lone Nutter mainstream books. This is Jim Moore's book, Os Oswald had been walking, had been walking a Patton. Tippett stopped Oswald. This is Gerald Posner's book. J.D. Tippett saw Oswald, decided to stop 
Oswald went over to the curb beside, behind Oswald. I think, I think you guys get the point. But all these books, this is Dale Myers' website for the Tippett family. This is Vincent Bugliosi's book, Spots Oswald. This is, this is this, this Bill O'Reilly's book, Tippett Stop, Jolong Oswald, James Swanson's book, David Von Pine's book. I mean, that's not right. Because if you start out with Oswald, then what else could you conclude? And of course, this is the 50th anniversary plastered on CNN, mainstream media. Jay Tippett was shot four times by Oswald. That's not right. So, okay, so, so what I want to do now is to uh, talk a, 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 a little bit of myth busting right here. Okay, first of all, myth one Jefferson Davis Tippett. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Confederacy. That wasn't his name. His name was not Jeff. His name was not Jefferson Davis. His name was J.D. In fact, uh, this was discovered by Larry Harris. Uh, he had he interviewed Tippett's sister Joyce back in the 1970s, and she explained to him that a well, hundred years ago now, yeah, a hundred years ago, their father was uh, reading a little dime novel, action-packed thriller, and he liked the character so much that he named his oldest son J.D. So his name was not Jefferson Davis, it was J.D. And But one time when he, he was filling out a form sometime in his life, they were like, well, you have to put a name down. And he was like, uh, okay, John. But that wasn't his name. Last name, Tip. Come on, people. We, I, we still see, to this day, people misspelling his name in articles and books everywhere. It's Tippet. It's not Tippet. It's not tip pip, pip, it, it. It's not, it's definitely not Tippet, so that was his last name. Myth number three, he was, you hear all the time he was killed at an intersection. He was actually not killed at an intersection. He was killed three houses down from an intersection. I mean, nowhere in, we don't say Kennedy was killed on Elm and Houston. We say he was killed on, on Elm Street, right? So he was, so Officer Tippet was killed on 10th Street, 10th Street. And the crime and the crime scene has changed a lot since since then. A lot. This is a historical plaque, very misleading historical plaque. There's only probably you know 48 things wrong with it, but uh, it doesn't do it any good that it's that the historical plaque is at the intersection. That makes it worse because it makes people think, oh, this is the spot where it happened. No, it happened way over here. Again, three houses down. There is now an X, someone who has put an X that is now there, just like in Dealey Plaza. So if you don't want to know who it is, just ask me afterwards. It's not me, though. Not me. But it is. I can't verify it is accurate, and that's exactly where Officer Tippett was killed. Okay, here's a common myth. Ten, that ten witnesses identified Oswald. And in fact... Oh, Vincent Bugliosi said in his book, you know, show me, show me any other case where ten eyewitnesses were wrong, where they were wrong, where ten witnesses were wrong. Well, well, first of all, four of those I, I, identifications are absolutely worthless because they, uh, Russell Patterson, Mary Brock, William Lawrence Smith, they were shown Oswald's photo, as I said, months after he was dead and nationally known. As for Helen Markham, she testified, like I said, that she did not be anybody. And moreover, there's no document from that day that says she identified anybody. As for William Scoggins, line, this is very interesting. Lineup participant Daniel Lujan testified that actually there was no Saturday lineup because once, the, once they were marched on the stage, Oswald began complaining about the unfairness of it and the police took them back outside and never brought them back in. So there was no lineup on Saturday. And even so, Scoggins picked the wrong photo in a photo lineup and could not ID Oswald as the killer when shown a photo by the FBI. So this leaves us with, like I said, four people. Barbara Davis, Virginia Davis, Ted Calloway, and Sam Ginyard. 
So Bugliosi's question should instead be, show me any other case where four eyewitnesses were wrong. Okay, here we go. In 2012, six eyewitnesses misidentified a murderer. Lagle Grant was exonerated by DNA in 2020. So there it is, Mr. Bugliosi. There it is. And the thing that you'll never hear by the mainstream media is that the 12 witnesses, like I said, refused to identify Oswald. And these are the names of the witnesses, the 12 witnesses right here. And what they, and what they really won't tell you is that five witnesses said the killer was not Oswald. And these are them right here. Here's a myth. Okay, um, Mrs. Clemens, uh, Quilla Clemens. She was. She. Uh, I'm sure everyone here knows who she is. She was living on 10th Street in the next block, and uh, she famously uh, said that she saw two men who were involved. And that's always been a conundrum, as we'll see in a second. But uh, one myth is that she did, didn't see the shooting, and that's. I mean, I simply quote her right here. I I saw some shots. I saw some shots. She's an eyewitness to the killing. Here's another myth about her. Mrs. Clemens wasn't on her front porch. Oh, yes, she was. First of all, Mrs. Clemens was first interviewed on her front porch by Shirley Martin, the great, late, first-generation researcher, Shirley Martin. She interviewed Mrs. Clemens on Mrs. Clemens' front porch where she witnessed the murder. And she and so well, they're sitting on the front porch. She's being interviewed, and she said, "I got tired, came out here, and sat down here on the front porch. I was just sitting out here." So she was out there. She did witness the shoot. Okay. So this is a myth that has been brought up uh, in recent years that uh, that the second man that she saw was not really an accomplice that it was um, and that it was another witness by the name of Frank Semino who lived across the street and, uh, and she's and people say that oh this is the man this is the guy who she saw across the street but this this is literally impossible because Semino who ran out of his house never said anything about seeing the gunman, much less the gunman waving to him, the gunman running away from the scene, and then he himself running away from the scene. I mean, honestly, this is perhaps the most desperate nonsense I've ever heard. So no, this wasn't the second man that Mrs. Clemens saw. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. These are the five witnesses on 10th Street who watched the murder go down. Jimmy Burt, Bill Smith, Donnie Benavides, Bill Scoggins, and Helen Markham. Now, an honest question. It, this is an honest question. Why did, these, why did the other five eyewitnesses miss Mrs. Clemens's the second man that she saw across the street? Now, it is very possible that these people are looking at where the action is. The squad car and the man on the sidewalk. Mrs. Clemens was in a position where she could see all of it. So she could look over and see someone else across the street. So it is very possible that these five witnesses miss, missed another person. Missed seeing another person. And Mrs. Clemens is also a part of three witnesses that gave accounts that very different, that very from the other witnesses. Of course, she said that two men were involved. She saw, or that she saw two men. We have a guy named Frank Wright who said that the killer hopped in a great, hopped in a great car and drove away. No one else saw this. And we have a guy named Jack Tatum who was driving through the intersection at the time. He heard shots and he turned around and he saw the killer step into the street, take careful, deliberate aim at Tippett as he's lying on the ground and fire one more shot into him. No one else saw this. And no one, and no one else reports a 
shots and then a pause and then another shot. So it's really a shame that we can't get eyewitness accounts to match up. All we know is that a man on the sidewalk shot Tim. And that's basically the only thing that everyone agrees on. Another myth is that Mrs. Clemens didn't see the killer. But uh, I want to read this quote from her, and you tell me, and you tell me if this is re- sounds real or not. Mrs. Clemens, I just tried to get out of the way because I thought he was going to shoot me. I was getting out of the way. I saw him unloading and loading his gun. I was afraid. He frightened me to come out and see him unloading his gun and reload it. I was getting out of his way. He acted like he wanted to shoot me. I was pretty close to him. I was standing right there, and I didn't want him to be shooting me. She witnessed the killing, period. Okay, so this this is a conundrum right here. We talked about the bullets in my, in the, in the opening, but uh, this is one myth right here is that all of the shells at the scene were automatics, but that's actually impossible because if the man's on the sidewalk shooting Tippett, the automatic shells, which automatically eject, should have been found right there on the sidewalk, but they weren't. They were found on the corner house, and again, we're three houses down from the intersection. The, sh- the witnesses, many witnesses saw the killer tapping out the shells and throw them on the ground over by the corner house, way over here. So if they were all automatics, then they would be found right there, but they weren't. People saw them tapping out, throw them over here, and that's exactly where they were found. However, it seems inconceivable that Sergeant Jerry Hill could be wrong when he looks at the shells gets on the radio and says, quote, the shells at the scene indicate that the suspect is armed with an automatic 38 rather than a pistol. And I happen to have the two right here. I'm not sure if y'all can see this. This is an automatic 38, and this is a revolver 38 special, which is what Oswald had, or supposedly had. I'm not sure if y'all can see it. And by the way, he says indicate. What does that mean? The shells the same indicate. Well, the dictionary says the she- show, to point out or to show. So he's saying the shells at the scene show that the suspect is armed with an automatic rather than a revolver. And as you can see, there's a massive difference right there. Any cop can tell the difference between these two. Okay. So... Tippett could not have been shot with an automatic, but there had to have been at least one automatic shell found at the scene. So, is it possible that this was unrelated? I really don't know. I really, really don't know, but uh, Sergeant Hill did privately admit to a fellow officer, Stavis Ellis, that it, that yeah, we did find an automatic shell, but oh, it was unrelated. So, (laughs) he originally and correctly said that he saw three spent shells. And this is important because originally there were two shells found and later that evening two more were found. So if he's saying there were three found, well, there's that automatic shell. And he said he looked, quote, looked on the bottom of the shell before he made his radio call. That's with Malice, page 323. And like I said, he even later admitted that, yeah, it was unrelated. But he never said that publicly. But then he shockingly reversed and out of the blue stated, oh, I did not pick up the hole and look at the butt of it. But yes, he did. That's exactly what he said he did. Quote, he said, I looked on the bottom of the shell. I mean, that just goes against everything. He he then incredibly said, 
Oh, I said on the radio it was possibly an automatic. So stop. Stop. This is a blatant lie. For it's on tape. It's on tape that he called it an automatic. Right there. But wait, there's more. He even denied that the voice on the police tapes was his. That's volume seven, page 57. <laughs> what a shame. He said in his oral history with the Sixth Form Museum that he didn't pick up the shells, but he originally said he did. And not only that, but he put a mark in it. And he also came up with the story that, oh, he only thought that it was an automatic because he had no idea that the suspect had kicked out the shells. He said this in multiple interviews. But, act, but this, too, is a blatant lie, for he testified, he, he was told on the scene that, quote, the suspect had reloaded his gun and dropped these in the grass. Volume 7, page 48 through 49. This man deliberately lied to cover up the fact that an automatic shell was found at the tippet scene. He tried his absolute damnedest to CYA and make it a foobar. You, got, you guys know what that means, right? Okay. <laughs> and plus, as a PS, he said, quote, I, I looked down and saw them on the ground. I mean, this too is important because, like I said, there's zero chance that Hill... A cop would have mistaken a revolver shell for an automatic shell. They are completely different, as shown here and here. If anyone wants to look at the shells, I can show you. Yeah. Here's another myth. Uh, as I said, the lineups were very unfair, and they and a lot of lone nutters, people who believe the one commission report have have said, you know. Basically, everyone's in agreement. Even, even Vincent Biliosi says that, that the lineups would have been thrown out and that they weren't fair. But one myth about the lineups is that all the men in the lineups wore suits. And this is a picture we've all seen. The people say, oh, my God, you, know, you get to stick Lee in there with the, with the these two guys in suits. Oh, my gosh. You know, but actually, I've reconstructed how the lineup actually was based on the testimony of the lineup participants. And fun fact, they all, all the lineup participants testified before the commission, which I, I, think, I think a lot of people forget about. Uh, but they were in neatly attired dress. One of them had a red vest. Another guy had a nice knit sweater. And, the, and one of them had a brown sport coat. But he took the tie off. So... Um, I was like, can you pick out the guy that's just been arrested? I mean, <laughs> so, anyway, and this is a good point that was brought up by Larry Harris in his 1993 article. He says, according to a Secret Service report, Oswald complained of a lineup wherein he had not been he had not been granted a request to put on a jacket similar to similar to those worn by some of the other individuals in the lineup. Why would Oswald want to wear a jacket if he had supposedly discarded the one he was wearing when he supposedly shot Tippett? So I think that's a really good point. Really good point. And by the way, this is a... Everything you need to, you need to know about the lineups is in this fantastic fantastic article by Mr. Gil Jesus. It's right there. Were the lineups, uh, were, were the Oswald lineups valid? Published in 2009. This is the best thing ever written on the lineups, in my opinion. Here's another myth, that uh, shirt fibers conclusively, supposedly, conclusively link Oswald to the crime that supposedly the um, Oswald's uh, shirt fibers were in the jacket that was ditched by the Tippett killer. Out of the millions of pages in the National Archives, only a single random page claims this. Wasn't mentioned by the Warren Report or testimony. Wasn't mentioned by the HSCA. Who did this alleged test? When? Where? Where are the test results? Where are the lab reports? You see, we don't know jack about this. All we have is a single 
random page clamminess. Absolute hearsay. And this is, and, it, and even so, even if that was true, you know, it could very well have been B. Oswald's jacket. That's an evidence now that absolutely can't be the jacket on the left, which was found and filmed that day. The white jacket, and here's the jacket that's now in evidence. So again, this could be Oswald's jacket on the right, but it, it now apparently has his shirt fibers in it. So, I mean, is that clear as day or, or, or am I just, and this is, whew, whew, this is where we, here I made a color chart of all, of how all the eyewitnesses described the killer's jacket and they vary different, they vary very differently and this again, this is, unfortunately goes to the basic fact that, you know, eyewitnesses are, are can be, Unreliable. We have black all the way to almost to light blue. To, you can see it right there. It's just incredible. I also made a pie chart of the tip of ear witnesses. And again, this is just insane. Three people heard two shots. Two people heard, heard two or three shots. Five people heard three shots. Two people heard three or four shots. One person heard four shots. One person heard four or five shots. One person heard five shots. One person heard six shots. Three people didn't specify and two couldn't tell. I mean, brother. Okay. And I could really go on for about two hours without repeating myself, but to really nail down why Oswald could not have killed Tippett is that the Warren report said Oswald entered his rooming house at 1 p.m. and left at 1.03 p.m. That's page 158 of the report. Housekeeper Earlene Roberts said Oswald entered the house at, quote, approximately 1 p.m. and stayed, quote, no longer than four or five minutes. She said that, quote, several minutes later, several minutes later, she looked out the front window and saw Lee standing by the bus stop. Now let's put everything together. <clears throat> One o'clock plus four or five minutes plus several minutes, let's say five, because a few minutes is considered two minutes, so several minutes would you know, be about five, so let's say five. So one o'clock plus four or five minutes plus several minutes, let's say five, equals 109, 110 p.m. So at 1.09, 1.10 p.m., Oswald is still at the bus stop one mile away from 10th and Patton. The Warren report claimed he killed Tippett at 1.16 p.m. Oswald could not have walked a mile in six to seven minutes. Now in 1998, Dale Myers, in his book, found that Tippett was killed at 1.14 p.m., which makes it even better. So... Uh, uh, Oswald could not have walked a mile in four to five minutes. So, Lee Oswald is exonerated. Stick to the facts. Okay. Mrs. Roberts said Oswald entered the house, as I said, at approximately 1 p.m. Dale Myers, he's pushed it back to 12.57. Roberts said Oswald was in his room no longer than four or five minutes. Myers reduces it to two minutes. Roberts said she saw Oswald standing by the bus stop several minutes later. Myers changes it to moments later. Oswald would have started walking to 10th and Patton, as we've seen, at around 109, 110 p.m. But Myers has morphed it into 1259, so he's pushed it back 10 minutes. Oswald, as we've said, would have been walking west. Myers invents a scenario where Oswald walked east and reversed, but that's impossible. That is literally impossible because five witnesses in the neighborhood would have seen the man walk by them twice, which he never did. Myers says the man then did an about face, you've all heard of this, when he saw Tippett approaching. No witness saw this. Please, guys, just don't fall for low nut for spit. Just, as I said, stick 
to the facts. Stick to the facts. Okay, here's a, <laughs> here's a dumb argument. It's a very dumb argument. You hear about oh, Oswald was a fit Marine. He was a fit Marine. He could make it in no time. You know, well that <laughs> this common argument is absolutely outrageous and reduces the evidence to literally nothing. It just outright and blatantly ignores the evidence which has Oswald being seen several minutes after 103, that would be about, you know, 108, and about 114 is, you know, when supposedly Tippett was slain a mile away. So therefore, it's impossible for Oswald to have walked or jogged there. It's just, it's a dumb argument. This comes from author Joseph McBride, page 459 of his book. He says, quote, while it is unlikely that Oswald was even at the scene of the crime, it's not impossible, but if he was, he had to have been driven there by someone. And that in itself would tend to be evidence of some kind of conspiracy. My conclusion is not Oswald didn't kill Tippett. My conclusion is that the official story has not met its burden of proof. However, these are the fingerprints that were lifted from Tippett's patrol car. We have two eyewitnesses, Jimmy Burt and Helen Markham. They both said that uh, when the killer was uh, talking to Tippett through the open vent window, he put his hands on Tippett's car. And these are the fingerprints that were lifted, and they do not match Oswald. And notice that there is a smear and that actually goes very well with what the Tippett killer did. The witnesses say that he leaned over to talk to Tippett through the vent window. He put his hands on his car, and then something was said, and then suddenly the killer took two quick steps back on the sidewalk like that. If his hands were touching the car, they would smear exactly what we see right here. So that's just something to think about whenever someone says, oh, well, it could be anyone's prints. So, and these prints do not match Oswald. This is the lead detective on the case. He told Gary Fannin, researcher Gary Fannin, in 1988, Oswald would have never been found guilty of killing Tippett or JFK at the time of his death. This is, I'm not even going to get into this. <laughs> this is this, this wallet. Um, there's a wallet that was found at the scene, and supposedly it had all. It's it's just we don't we don't really have enough time to go into it by right, right now, but I'll share it with anyone who wants to hear it. Okay, so this is a good question. Where did the where did the real killer go? Okay, we have a witness by the name of Mrs. Slider who saw the killer ditch his jacket in the alley. Two women found the jacket in the alley and hung it up on a fence post, and we have an informant. Uh, it went by H2. This informant said, quote, the assailant ran westward down the alley, turned right at Crawford, ducked into the hospital area of the Abundant Life Annex, hid there for a while, and, while, and then made his way to the second floor of the annex building. By this time, his pursuers had passed. The assailant climbed out of a second floor window at the southeast corner of the building, jumped to the ground, the second floor is quite low, and continued across Crawford and down the alley westward. So that's where the real killer went. Was Tippett involved? This is a big question. You know, I have to agree and concur with Larry Harris and Greg Lowry. They studied Tippett the most. Dallas research, they were Dallas researchers who studied this case the most, and I have to agree with them that Tippett was not involved in the plot to kill Kennedy. Now here's a quote from Larry Harris in 1992. This is from Joseph McBride's book, Into the Nightmare, page 439. This is Larry Harris speaking. I was never able, this is Larry Harris speaking, I was never able to link Tippett to any plot or conspiracy I feel, like, I feel like I know this guy. I have a feel for who he was, and he would not willingly or knowingly have participated in any plot or a conspiracy. It was totally out of character for Tippett. Tippett was just a good old East Texas farm boy. <laughs> he had been on the force for 11 years without promotion, no hope of getting promoted. He was a very 
He was a very simple, down-to-earth guy. His main interests were fishing and playing dominoes and that kind of thing. There was nothing, there was nothing complex about Tippin other than that he had marital problems. And again, that's Larry Harris in 1992. In, clo in closing, I want to close this off with a quote from Larry. This is how he, this is a quote, this is him in 1993 at the Ask Conference. And again, I really wish it was him who was giving this presentation and not me, because he died far too young. This is what Larry Harris said, quote, I think that anyone who studies the evidence objectively and in its entirety will come away disturbed by what they find because there's a lot of indications that Oswald was not the killer and that he was nowhere near there. In closing, it's unfortunate that the Tippett murder has been virtually regulated to footnote status in history. You know, when the House Select Committee reopened the Kennedy investigation in the 1970s, they came out with their final report. They devoted a scant three paragraphs to the Tippett murder and concurred with the Warren Commission findings that Oswald was the killer of Tippett. And it's ironic because back at the time, 30 years ago, the Tippett murder, which led police to Oswald and was, and it was the Tippett murder which went a long way in pursuing, in persuading the public that Oswald you know, killed the policeman and therefore probably killed President Kennedy. But the Tippett murder at that time and even now is depicted as virtually an open and shut case against Oswald. But I think if you'll read up and study the record, you'll find that the Warren Commission findings leave a lot to be desired and that there's a lot about the Tippett murder that we don't know. It seems at this late date that we may never be able to resolve the Tippett murder. It seems, at this point at least, that it seems destined to remain the other unsolved murder on November 22nd. End of quote. Thank you. I await your question. What's your thoughts on uh, Larry Crawford as the killer of Officer Tippett? That is a good point. And in fact, if you look at photos of Larry Crawford, he looks a lot like Oswald. Uh, apparently from the side, which is where the Davis sisters saw him and everything. And it's, he looks a lot like him. There's a, a lot of, uh, he's a very suspicious character and uh, he is a lot to, he needs to be looked into. Yes. Mrs. Compton, we don't really know. She had two sons. According to Mary Farrell, she might have been dead in the 70s, but she, uh, she was told not to talk or else, you know, something, you know, you could, get killed on the, you could get killed on the way to work, is what she was told. Told by who? By Dallas police officers. And uh, she did have two sons. She was interviewed by a lot of researchers, by the way. Many of y'all have seen her film interview with Mark Lane, but she was interviewed by Georgia Patricia Nash, Earl Goltz, uh, a guy named Johnson, Shirley Martin. Dor she, she was interviewed by Dorothy Kilgallen. She was interviewed by Mark Lane. She was interviewed by a lot of people in the 60s, but she disappeared. We don't really know where she is. Her family might know, but we just, it's a dead end. Yes. Yes, uh, I was a Dallas police officer for uh, seven years, and uh, what I noticed on the uh, statement from the uh, ambulance drivers by the names of Clinton Butler and Eddie yep. Kinsley, okay, in their statement they said uh, they come up on the scene and he was covered, and when they uncovered him, that's when they found out he was a police officer. Yes, I actually. That, if that's true, then why did uh, the female? Witness say she talked to him all the way into the ambulance. Yeah, that was Helen Markham who right. said that she talked to Tippett or that she had a conversation with Tippett, but she was a very unreliable witness. And uh, I worked um, in the ambulance also, and if you have signs of obvious death, okay, you're not going to do CPR. Yeah, yeah, of course yeah. not. Yeah. Okay. okay. And also, as a police officer, if I know this is a dead body, it's a crime scene. So being a crime scene, you can't take that body off until you do 
forensic, photographs, yep. measurements. All in his statement, he said he picked. He thought he was dead. That's what he said. I thought he was dead, and we transported. Uh, one of the guys at the scene boldly helped him pick him up, put him in the ambulance. Okay, so if this is all true, they picked him up within minutes and got him to the uh, Methodist Hospital? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the captain asked for one slug to be removed from Tippett. Okay, and that was taken to FBI. Is there a question? Okay. Is there a question? Well, I'm just saying, the, the, the slugs that came out of Tippett were different slugs. One was Remington. And the other the three other types of slugs. The brands of shells were different. Exactly. The bullets could never be linked to the revolver. Okay, I was wondering if you knew this because officers don't carry different slugs. One of the uh, one of the witnesses at the scene said they thought they saw two suspects. Yes. Okay, if that's true then, if they're shooting two different weapons, that would come out to different slugs in the, in the suspect, or in the complainant, being tipped. I'm just wondering if you if you thought about that. There were two. Yeah, the shells did not match each other. They were exactly. different brands, and and that's why people have suspected that that um, that there was a fish shot that would have and been. It never came from that weapon. So they could never be. The bullets could never be traced to Oswald's weapon. That is correct. Yes. Yep. Uh, are you aware that the uh, the laundry was found in the jacket? was found for the jacket. Uh, I know that they came very close to finding the laundry. If it has been found in recent years, that's great. I would love to hear about it. But uh, They came close to it, but they gave up. I think you're thinking about where it was manufactured. Yeah, it wasn't no, no, not manufactured. Exactly, yeah. That jacket uh, could not be linked to Oswald. Yes? Matt, uh, I think uh, the Tippett murder is the key to everything. Uh -huh. uh, what, what is your theory? I mean, Oswald was in the area. We know he's arrested at the Texas Theater, you know, very, uh -huh. you know, there after the Tippett killing. Uh -huh. Oswald's in the area. If Oswald is not in the killing, what, what's the Tippett murder about? What, what is it? That's we don't know. That it could be totally unrelated. It could be it, we don't know. We just know what we know. Uh, yes. You. Me. Yeah. You. Thank you. <laughs> the Into the Nightmare author said that J.D. Tippett was in fact behind the picket fence, dressed as Badge Man. No, but to me that means that's kind of pushing it. And so I'm asking you, don't you think he lacks kind of credibility? I mean, it, it, in that regard, that, as opposed to Myers, who at least he takes the more traditional view, but at least he's not making crack That's episodes. why I said that Joseph McBride's book is a mixed bag. It has fabulous information, but he jumps the gun on some things. Yes, ma'am? Say that again. I think that was summarized very well in the book, uh, JFK and the Unspeakable. It's told very beautifully there, so I would recommend anyone to read that. So you give credibility to it. Credibility? I find it fascinating. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't see why he would lie. What uh, addendum? I know you're seeming to be building a case that Oswald wasn't at the scene of the J.D. Tibbet murder, but it's astonishing how close that location is to. Um, Ruby's apartment. In yeah. person, yeah. even more so than it looks on a map, if you look at Google Map, it looks a little... If you're in there in person, it is so yeah. close to me. Had Oswald been walking east, as the Warren report said he claimed he did, which we know he wasn't, which we know he wasn't, uh, he would have been headed to Jack Ruby's apartment. Uh, yes, yellow shirt. It's possible that the looked a lot like Ben What's, what's the question? 
you, you're saying that you know, Tidbit looks like Badgeman? Um, it's a claim we can't, it's impossible to say yes or no. It's impossible. All we, yes, you're right there. Yes. Did Oswald have a firearm in the theater? Yes, all the witnesses there said that yeah, he did have one, but that does not mean that he killed Tippett. And he was also not functional. What? He was also not functional. That is actually a good thing. People say that the people say that the firing pin was bent. I can't find any document that says that. If anyone can send it to me, that would be great. But people, he pulled his gun on Officer McDonald. The gun snapped, and if it misfired. So if it misfired, then how? Why would they believe it went off for tip? I, I think we have one more. Just real quick. Are there any theories that Roscoe White? Uh, Gary Shaw has a book out. I'm happy. I can't wait to read it. So, um, and uh, we'll have to see what's in there. We've been waiting a long time. So, good. And if you guys have any more questions for me or want to look at the shells, you can see them over here. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone.